Abercrombie Street in Port of Spain begins at South Quay. Traveling along it northward, it crosses Independence Square, passes Trinity Cathedral, Woodford Square, the Red House, the Hall of Justice. It crosses Park Street towards St. Joseph's Convent and Lord Harris Square to come to an end at Gordon Street, or Barrack Street, as it was once called. This grand tour de force of Port of Spain's history is named for General Sir Ralph Abercrombie, who was responsible for the capture of the island from the Spanish crown. Towards the end of 1796, the situation in Port of Spain was bordering on the chaotic. The French Revolution of 1789 had found a furious reflection of itself in Saint-Domingue, Haiti. Rich, avid, and tempestuous, the largest and most productive of the Caribbean slave colonies, Santo Domingo was pregnant with all the ingredients necessary to produce violence of a scale never before seen in the New World. It is said that it was the better off refugees who found their way to Trinidad, a Spanish colony. Various people of various political hues flocked to the island at the most southern end of the Caribbean chain. Towards the end of the Spanish period, the cedula of population in 1783 brought a population to Trinidad. That was a significant beginning. Thousands of French came into the island, bringing their slaves, opening up plantations, really developing the island. The other significant beginning was the conquest in 1797. The conquest by the British brought an end to Spanish rule. For the French, the majority being royalists, the arrival of a Spanish squadron in the Gulf of Paria was a godsend. England had declared war on Spain, so Trinidad was now under threat of an attack by the British Navy. Apart from the general state of turmoil that prevailed in the city, bands of would-be revolutionaries, both black and white, more or less rioted at the least provocation. This was as much as the governor Don Jose Maria Chacon could handle. Port of Spain was a haven for the flotsam and jetsam of the Caribbean. In 1797, it was peopled by half-caste Spaniards, broad-nosed Zambos, high-strung mestizo women, French Republican soldiers, white, black, and colored retired pirates, French nobility, and the ghosts of conquistadors who had died in the previous centuries in search of El Dorado, eaten by the Anthropomorgai people in the jungles of Guiria. In the 1770s, the island was almost deserted. A handful of Spaniards who lived there, most were stranded. Before the French immigration, there was no economy, so there was no slavery, at least not enough to make a difference. In 1783, French colonists came armed with a cedula of population, which the King of Spain had granted to Catholic settlers. The French Revolution was in the islands to the north, Victor Hughes had arrived with a guillotine, a sharp, quick, royalist killing machine. Escaping slaves, escaping masters, they all came to Trinidad. The Spanish authorities could hardly handle the locals, much less the high-style emigre French. No one really expected that the French Revolution would send whole communities of French Creoles with their slaves, octoroon mistresses, and pass-for-white children tumbling into backwater Trinidad. The Spanish squadron, which had been equipped at Cadiz and ordered to sail for Cartagena, was told to pass by Trinidad and to land troops in the event of Governor Chacon fearing an attack. Commanded by Rear Admiral Don Sebastián Ruiz de Apodaca, this squadron consisted of four major ships of the line, two of them armed with 74 cannons each, and the flagship of 84 and a frigate of 36 guns. The flotilla arrived in December and Chacon, using his powers, kept the squadron in Trinidad. On the other hand, the British Admiralty too had dispatched an expeditionary squadron to the Caribbean, commanded by Rear Admiral Sir Henry Harvey. 
It consisted of 20 battleships, seven of which carried more than 60 cannons apiece, with one, the Prince of Wales, the flagship, being armed with 100 cannons. A large number of French royalists were serving with the British forces in the Caribbean against Republican France. Amongst these were the Count of Lopineau and his four sons, the Count de Montalembert, General de Source, Colonel Gaudin de Sauter, Chevalier de Verteuil, Chevalier de Bruny, Marquis de Montrichard, and Vicomte de Bragelonne. Some of these were to stay on and form families who put down roots in Trinidad and Tobago. One of the significant events that took place in Trinidad towards the end of the Spanish period was the establishment of the first meridian of longitude in the Western Hemisphere. This was in Schacken's time. Schacken built an observatory on Laventy Hill for the observation of the stars. Spain's astronomer royal came all the way down here to do the sightings. And in 1792, the first meridian of longitude was established here. The British squadron rendezvoused at Cariacou. On the 15th of February 1797, they set sail for Trinidad, and on the morning of the next day, they were in sight of the Dragon's Mouth. Within hours, everybody in town knew what was happening. Admiral Apodaca and Governor Chacon met in private. There seemed not too much choice. Apodaca could lift anchor and flee by way of the serpent's mouth, or he could challenge a superior foe and be destroyed. On the other hand, he could surrender his ships, or he could destroy them. He chose the latter. In council with his captains, the order was given to set fire to the Spanish ships anchored in the Gulf of Paria. Pandemonium reigned that night in Port of Spain. Hundreds of people were in the streets. Lighted torches brightened the excited eyes of the blacks as both free and slave rushed to and fro, gathering information and passing it on. The French royalist leaders approached the governor to inquire as to the position of the militia, and Chacon replied to them, little by little, gentlemen. To this day, scholars debate Chacon's and Apodaca's actions. Was it that the Spanish establishment in the town was already overwhelmed by the aggressive Republicans present, who had made contact with others of their ilk in the nearby islands, and as such were glad to see the British? Did they between them fully understand that the days of Spanish glory were quickly passing and that what was happening should be over sooner rather than later? Did they think better the British monarchy, the traditional Protestant enemy, than a godless, murderous, revolutionary onslaught that would wipe out the work done by the colonists from 1783 to 1797? Loud cries of to arms and we are betrayed were heard on all sides. The roads were filled with indignant men and women and weeping children. In the midst of all this violent excitement, only Governor Chacon remained unmoved. Through his fear of the Republicans, he was resolved to throw himself into the arms of the enemy. As a precaution, he decided to send the archives and the treasure to Don Jose Mayan, who was Justice of the Peace at St. Joseph. And these were buried under the trees on a cocoa plantation. At about 2 a.m., a great glow suddenly appeared in the west, and an awful cry arose above the tumult. Great consternation and fear gripped everyone. From the distance, great booming explosions echoed in the St. Anne's and Maraval valleys as the gunpowder stores blew up in the holes of the Spanish ships, blazing, lighting the passage of an empire, marking the end of an era when Spain ruled the Western world.
General Abercrombie sailed away with Sir Henry Harvey's fleet to attack Puerto Rico. They left behind Abercrombie's aide-de-camp, Colonel Thomas Picton. Picton enforced military rule on Trinidad. Newly conquered, Port of Spain existed at that time in various stages of anarchy, and Picton's tenure is marked by atrocities that he dished out to all and sundry, high and low, black and white, even his own troops. Fundamental nature of this country is in fact this cosmopolitanism. People from all over the world have come here. They have made their lives, they have established themselves. Cycles of festivals seem to dominate our existence. But principally, what we are about is creating futures. In these programs, we will bring to you, purpose being to entertain, to enthuse, to bring enjoyment to history more than anything else, so that you can basically understand something of your past, grasp it in the present, and take it into the future. When during Picton's tenure as governor, a slave girl ran off with a soldier and they were captured, the soldier received 1,500 lashes. The girl was hanged first thing that morning and a master had to come and collect the body. Trinidadians were rebellious and violent in Picton's eyes. When on the run from the law, they liked to run into the church for sanctuary. Picton abolished sanctuary and put up a gallows in Marine Square. building here that everyone takes as a modern building, it stands here on the spot where Picton's government house once was. A lot of history lies about Port of Spain in a very casual sort of way. Picton's government house was there. Picton's gallows was somewhere in this immediate vicinity. And Picton was the kind of man, when he ran this country, he would say to the people, if you did not obey the law, the wind will pass beneath your feet at yonder gallows. And you know, he meant it. At high noon, a slave is beheaded on Frederick Street. His head is sent to St. Joseph. His body is filled with sulfur, tied to a living man. Both are set afire in Brunswick Square, later Woodford Square, the University of Woodford Square. Talk about teaching them a lesson. Picton, however, is best remembered for the Luisa Calderon affair. Luisa Calderon had a man. He was rich. He had a schooner. They lived on Marine Square with the sea right there. It smelled fishy. And Luisa didn't like the mud to squish between her toes. She had really pretty feet. And her cheeks were soft, round. Everything about her was a little round. Somebody broke the trunk. People had heard a crack in the heat of the day. Luisa's man raised a cry. He said it was her. She said he lied. So there was another man? Was he her other man? Bacchanal. She pelted through the streets, her thin frock hugging her roundness. Picton saw Luisa twice. He saw her that evening when they brought her into the hall at Government House on the corner of Charlotte Street and Marine Square and accused her of theft. Four years later, he saw her again in London at his trial. By then, she had changed. She looked like a rich woman from the Caribbean, wearing gold bracelets and earrings and a small straw hat atop her gorgeous turban, which was decorated with zipang tremblant trembling pins of gold. The climate of England agreed with her complexion. She owned a carriage and could discuss in guineas. Where did she get all that money? A 
reply the question. That was the signal for a medieval form of torture carried out in the royal jail on Frederick Street. Puerto Rico, the slave belonging to Valot, the jailer, hoisted Luisa up by one hand. Her other hand was tied to her foot, bent back at the knee. Her other foot was lowered on a spike. The ball of her pretty little foot burst. The pain was terrifying. Confess! Confess! My eye. She didn't tell them a word. The following month, her ex-man paid cash for a shipment from down the main. She spent three years in jail. The old French families in Port of Spain, especially those who had a lot of priests in the family, have their own version of the story. They say that Luisa's grandfather was an Amerindian cacique down the main, who had raised a fortune in gold for the ransom of his over king, who had been captured. One thing led to another. The gold ended up in Trinidad in six or eight calabashes, and Luisa knew where they were. Madame Rosta, who used to live opposite the jail, saw Luisa coming out of the prison, smoking a cigar. Towards the end of his tenure, Luisa Calderon's case was the only one that stuck to Picton in the 37 charges brought against him by elements of the British establishment. His downfall was his involvement with the internal politics of a slave society. Picton was very likely the victim of other people's conscience. He had established law and order, but he had done the wrong job. London did not want another West Indian slave colony. They wanted Trinidad to be a colony of free settlers, if only as an offering to the abolitionists. Picton had scared off the rich, the intellectuals, and potential investors. He had lost the chance for British interest on the main. It had been his idea in the first place. He had been an unemployed soldier of 38 who had come to the West Indies to make money and seek adventure and was not interested in slaves or revolution. Picton suffered for it, more out of shame than anything else. But in the end, he was the man who rallied a retreating battalion and turned their rout into a charge. Years later, he had been shot through but kept it to himself. The following day, he had held the line at Waterloo and had died there. The importance of teaching history in a multiracial society like Trinidad and Tobago cannot be better expressed than in the words of Pierre Gustave Louis Bord, historian of Trinidad, who wrote in 1876, without the teaching of history, there is no patriotism. Little bit by little bit, we become strangers in our own country. And following our weaknesses or inclinations, we make ourselves British, Indian, African, Syrian, Chinese, Portuguese, French, or Spanish, when in spite of everything, we are Trinidadians and Tobigonians. Thank you for watching Land of Beginnings, History of Trinidad and Tobago. Join us again.